in November the 9th, 1933, the great Austrian physicist Erwin Schrödinger came to this room, this office where I work, the office of the president of Magdalen College. Schrödinger had been at the Solvay conference in Brussels and he came here and was admitted on that day as a fellow of Magdalen College using Latin phrases that we use to the present day. After the ceremony in this room, the phone rang and it was from the Times of London. And the Times of London said that Schrödinger had just been awarded the Nobel Prize. So he was, heard he'd won the Nobel Prize in this room. And next day in the Times and the Telegraph newspapers, it stated that Schrödinger of Oxford University had won the Nobel Prize, even though he'd actually been employed before at the University of Berlin. What did Schrödinger win the Nobel Prize for? Well, it was for a paper he wrote in 1926, when he introduced his famous Schrödinger equation. Up to that time, um, the theory for explaining the energy of electrons in atoms had really been due to the famous physicist Niels Bohr, who had come up with a theory for explaining the spectrum of the hydrogen atom, the electronic spectrum of the hydrogen atom, and fitting the energy levels with his own formulae. But Bohr's theory didn't work very well at all for other atoms or even for molecules. It didn't seem to be a general one. What Schrödinger did is he came up with a general equation that worked for the hydrogen atom and, and worked for predicting not just the energy levels of the hydrogen atom, but also like the intensities of the spectral lines, whether this, the lines in the spectrum are intense or not. He could predict that intensity and that was new. Not even his collaborators or his, the people who were competing with him like Heisenberg knew how to do that and Schrödinger did it with his equation. And then Schrödinger in the same year realised that he could apply his equation not just to the electronic energy levels of the hydrogen atom but to other problems like the vibration of a harmonic oscillator, like to the rotation of a diatomic molecule. The same equation could be applied and gave the results that agreed with experiment for those sorts of problems. And then Schrödinger realised his equation could also be adapted not just for simple processes but for processes that depend on time. So in fact there are two Schrödinger's equations, what's called the time independent equation and the time dependent equation. And, but why the equation became so significant is that suddenly many scientists around the world realised that not only did it work for the hydrogen atom, it worked for all atoms and all molecules in principle. And that means it had remarkable applications to nearly everything you can see. It depends on atoms and molecules and Schrodinger's equation can be used to calculate all their properties. And if you solve his equation very accurately, you get essentially the right answer. So it was a very powerful theory that came out of Schrodinger's great work in 1926 for all atoms and molecules. Now the problem is though, he, his equation was quite complicated mathematically and very difficult to solve for anything more complicated than the hydrogen atom. Even for the helium atom, it involved quite a lot of difficult integration and differentiation and so on. And so it didn't really change science so much in the very early days. But where the big change came with Schrodinger's equation was when computers came along. It was then possible to use computers to solve his equation and do that really accurately as time has gone on more and more. And that means Schrodinger's equation can be applied 
to more and more complicated systems, atoms, even now to, even to solids, materials, and also to problems of biological importance. You can do calculations with Schrodinger's equation, for example, on proteins, on enzymes, on DNA, and so on. Uh, and so it's become, in the modern world, an extremely powerful theory. It's the theory that underlies the whole of chemistry, molecular biology, material science, understanding the properties of materials. You can do calculations with Schrodinger's equation, and many people do that. Even in geology, you can calculate the temperature at the centre of the Earth using variants of Schrodinger's equation. And so in the, in the 21st century, it's become really almost the essential tool for doing simulations on atoms and molecules. The other method, before Schrodinger, was developed by Isaac Newton, Newton's laws. And you could simulate atoms and molecules using, uh, using Newton's laws, but those don't include, crucially, quantum mechanical effects, such as tunnelling, such as probability. Uh, they don't, Newton's laws just don't work for atoms and molecules, but Schrodinger's equation does. So Schrodinger came here in 1933, and he came to work here in Oxford. Uh, he was a fellow in my college. He lectured at the University uh, of Oxford on the quantum theory. But he wasn't very happy here. He had an appointment which was almost like a postdoctoral assistant. After being a top professor in the University of Berlin, he had an appointment that was just renewed every year, funded by ICI, uh, the, the chemical company. So he wasn't very happy. And he was here just for three years, and he missed his great friends in Berlin. He was, a, he was very friendly with Max Planck. Who'd, who, who, the person who discovered quantum theory. He was very friendly with Einstein, who was also in Berlin in the 20s. He missed his friends. And in the end, he was unhappy here, and after three years, he decided to move back to his home country of Austria, where he was, he was uh, given an appointment at the University of Graz in Austria, and also another appointment at the University of Vienna. And that's where Schrodinger went. He'd left Berlin in 1933 because he wasn't very happy with the politics that was going on in Germany at the time. Science and politics in those days really intermixed. Uh, he didn't like what the Nazis were doing. So he came to Oxford. But then he made the big mistake of going to Austria and he didn't realise that there were going to be problems in Austria because Hitler's troops marched in in 1938 and Schrodinger had to escape from Austria. There was a worry he might even be arrested. He managed to escape and he went to live in the Vatican for a short period and then he was contacted by the Premier of Ireland, de Valera, who asked him to go and work in Ireland. So Schrodinger actually then managed to come back here to Magdalen College, Oxford, in 1938, and from there went to Ireland. And he uh, started at the Institute uh, of Advanced Study in Dublin, in Ireland. And there he did another very important piece of work. He was thinking about atoms and molecules, and he realised that the fundamental principles of physics and chemistry, including his quantum mechanics, should be applied to the molecules of life. Molecules like DNA and proteins, which were just emerging at that time in the 40s, late 1940s. So Schrodinger wrote a book, a small book in, in uh, Dublin called What is Life? that was stating that the uh, basic principles of physics and chemistry could be applied to bio biology. Now, everybody knows that now. The field of molecular biology is explained by the basic principles, but in those times, people hadn't really thought about that. And some of the great uh, 
scientists, young scientists of the time, such as Watson and Crick, read his book and thought, I better get into molecular biology. And that's what they did. And so you got these great discoveries in the 1950s by people like Watson and Crick, of course, uh, using the structure uh, of, you know, of DNA uh, and, and then eventually after that RNA and other biological molecules were all inspired, inspired by Schrodinger's little book. So he was a remarkable person setting up the basic quantum theory that underlies all the properties that we can observe essentially of atoms and molecules and also starting the revolution in molecular biology that we've seen to the present day. A hugely influential person. He wasn't very popular, isn't it? He wrote all of his papers essentially on his own. Nowadays you have big research groups. Schrodinger did it on his own. An individual person. Uh, and never happy where he was. He wasn't very happy here in Magdalen College, Oxford. Um, he did his original work when, actually in Zurich, where he was just for a few years in the early 1920s. And he wasn't in, in, in Ireland for that long. And after the Second World War, he decided to go back to Austria, uh, where he'd had the problems in the Hitler times. But he was welcomed back to Austria as a hero. They put his... Uh, he, he put his face on the banknotes and on the stamps. A crater on the moon was named after him. And he became one of the great people of Austria at that time. But we still remember him here in Oxford. We were very grateful that the great scientist Schrodinger came here. My own research is in quantum chemistry. And that is solving Schrodinger's equations for atoms and molecules, and particularly for chemical reactions. So to me, he is my scientific hero. And as president of Magdalen College, where I work in this room, the place where Schrodinger heard he'd won the Nobel Prize, that is really quite something.